So first of all, what is Tempest? So uh, let's find the right item here. I think it should be under code name. No, oh, there we go. I skipped it. Funny, it's not under military. So the history of Tempest is actually for what is public. It's fairly nicely detailed on the Wikipedia page. I've read this maybe the first time 20 years ago and they kept adding things. So it's getting better and better. The code word Tempest is used to refer to signal emulations um, carrying data that you would want to have out there. In the most traditional sense, this was um, uh, CRT emissions, I guess, were the most prominent because of how much energy was involved and the ability to replicate the picture that was in a monitor um, at a distance, right? I don't uh, think in, this in, was, in some uh, sense, Bowen? it even before CRTs, um, the um, printing mechanism on a teletype or an IBM oh, Selectric, right. right? Um, and you're right, yeah. There was that, and I mean, there were other cases of signals intelligence for sure, um, but we don't want to um, get into too broad a subject, right? Um, so uh, we're going to leave those out, but I think the well, teletype is yourself. certainly fair. <laughs> no, that's all right. Your, your comments are always interesting. And I, I was thinking of something like, um, there is this movie that I've been trying to track down, a 1940s movie that's um, referred to in um, Hasselton's book. Uh, Hasselton has a strange career. He was a Disney executive and then he was hired by the government to be assistant director of the NSA. And um, he published a book around five years ago, I think, um, it's the man in Moscow station or something like that. And it mostly centers about, it centers around espionage uh, against the American embassy, which is all signals intelligence. But um, at the very beginning, he has this reference to a movie that I haven't been able to find yet, which is the 1940s movie, where apparently the plot is that, similar to what the Russians were doing to the US embassy in the 70s, um, the FBI or some other law enforcement agency is using the directed energy beam towards, I don't know, a room that they want to wiretap and exciting the speaker of the radio in that room so that they could then use it as a microphone. Um, and uh, there is quite a bit of research on the fact that if you send enough energy towards, <laughs> towards, um, Yes, yes. Um, send enough energy towards the target, you can turn almost anything into a microphone. And that's why the US NSC is, is constantly based in uh, almost dangerous levels of emissions in Moscow. It's uh, uh, actually outright our harassment at this point. Uh, but the, the hope is essentially, well, we can put enough energy in there that something is going to act like a microphone. Um, and apparently in this movie, they the plot was centered around this, but this was a 1940s movie. So I find the idea quite cool. Tried to tweet at the author who doesn't reply on Twitter anymore. And I tried to post to a few mailing lists that uh, Bill suggested to see if I can find what this movie is, but so far, no success. Um, but uh, the reason why this is interesting is that um, uh, side emissions, uh, which I think in Hazelton's book are referred to under the acronym uh, PEMIN, uh, which I believe is, uh, is the acronym that the Russians like to use for the subject, 
is um, is a fairly old topic, and um, uh, with a very long history. Now, if uh, I can, I'm going to skip to the next thing. I'm pretty sure that there is a 1970s or 80s BBC video. I'm actually maybe linked here. Let's see. Oh, another interesting cultural reference is um, uh, Neil Stevenson's Cryptonomicon. In, uh, in Neil Stevenson's Cryptonomicon, there is a Tempest type eavesdropping where they're trying to uh, steal information from an adjacent room in an hotel, um, essentially by um, by carrying out a, um, a leaked emissions um, um, attack. Yeah, here it's referenced. Uh, Van Eck freaking is what they call it there. It's fictional, but it's actually banned electronic image. A lot of details. I thought it was a nice addition to the plot. I wasn't expecting that. Cryptonomicon was actually really an awesome book. It's excellent. Let's see if we can get lucky. No. We can't. So we are going to go to my bookmarks uh, just in a second and find. Is that it? No, this is cool, but it's not. Um, let's see. So to make a long story short, essentially the, as far as we know, the Tempest code word is referring to what you need to do to prevent these side emissions. And so how far of a distance should you have around the military base to uh, not risk uh, side emanations being picked up, uh, how much shielding should you have, uh, and so on. And this uh, this is an old keyword, so I'm sure that there are newer standards, but essentially the entire thing has been subsumed uh, under this. Um, ah, there we go. Uh, I found it. Uh, Federico? Yeah. <clears throat> it, uh... It sounds like you went to a different web page, but we're seeing on your screen is still the Wikipedia page uh, where the certification. Yeah, you, should, you should see it. You should see it now. Okay, now we're seeing a YouTube page. Okay. Okay, we're seeing some kind of jerky video in the YouTube there, and it's like dead silent. We're not getting any audio from the YouTube. I'm sorry. Um, can you can you hear it? Um... No, I can't hear anything from the YouTube. But the, it just seems to be silent. Ah, okay. I will post the link for reference then. But um, essentially, it's a demonstration of of eavesdropping using um of um of an act freaking using um uh using the emanations from a um, crt and this was i believe early 80s so i'm not sure if there is a way i can share that and you can hear it um Uh, 
if the audio is not carrying through, then probably not. Uh, one second. <clears throat> okay. So uh, let me see. Can this is not a very visual video? It's not high production value stuff, but um, it's essentially showing how they try to read this terminal from a van. Um, outside the BBC and how they go about uh, decoding the signal. I'm going to save the Wi-Fi coordinator link so that I can read it later. Thank you to Brandon for sharing that. Oops, I clicked again on the same link. There we go. So um, one thing is uh, that these tethers are largely classified, and at least in the West. And instead, uh, it turns out that in Russia, with the fall of the Soviet Union, most of this expertise went over to the private sector in the 90s. The result is that apparently large enough companies in Russia can spy on each other using uh, Tempest-like attacks. And their IT departments have to, um, have to effectively protect against <laughs> this air-gapped threat vector that doesn't seem to be as common in, in the West. Um, I think that it would be good if we had a bit more information in the public sphere so that we could um, generally protect against this kind of thing uh, as a more normal course of action, because I don't think that, um, I don't think that either Russian or Chinese, um, um, not intelligence, but so much intelligence, but um, uh, trade secret uh, theft is bound by that sort of rule. So um, it would be good to be able to, to uh, shield from these things uh, as a matter of course. There was some information that got released, um, that got released, <clears throat> In the um, in the early knots, that was uh, all in Russian, but it was a book about um, about uh, Pemen that uh, was um, released in Russia and in, in uh, for public access in the um, in the first decade of the century. That book has since been reclassified, so you can find the title on Amazon, but good luck finding a copy. Um, so what little comprehensive type of information was available as in the, in the open has, uh, has disappeared. Uh, there was, um, there is another thing, which is, mm, we're going to define that. The, the Tempest specification itself has been declassified like, um, like Bill was mentioning. Um, it's on Cryptome. Let's find that. Oh, well, Federico. Oh, never mind. Yeah. It up. Now, I was about to say your uh, web browser was, uh, the main body was grayed out because you had something selected in the search window, but I guess you unclicked from that and it went away just as I started talking about All right. Yeah, I guess it has to have the focus. Uh, MT1. Uh, dash nine two dash one dash five dot htm. You can get the idea of how old it is. 
just from that extension. Oh, can you post that link in the chat window? Yeah. Uh, um, oops. Yeah. So. Oh, it's transcribed. Okay. All right. There is something here. So the, the original release was a photocopy of the, of the, uh, of a document with black marker all over the place. It was very colorful and really hard to read. So I guess they, they um, transcribed it and made it searchable this way. Um, I haven't read this uh, this year, but I read it when it was first released and there wasn't a lot of information that would have been interesting, like the, uh, the range um, that was prescribed. But it, and there were some, um, there were some details in terms of power levels that were considered of concern. Um, so it, it didn't, if I remember correctly, it didn't disclose what the protected range is or what is the required range that the government is, uh, is demanding for considering things safe, uh, but, um, but it didn't indicate what uh, power levels were of concern. It's better than nothing. The FAA, um, FCC has, uh power levels for controlled and uncontrolled access spaces. It's in the novice test for ham radio license now. Actually, since you are a ham person, kind of person, why, um, why is the FCC uh, send their disclaimer saying that device must not cause harmful interference which seems obvious and it must accept that's, interference i never understood that that's part. one of the things that, that's one of the things they require but they also require that a <coughs> licensed installation uh not have um emanations that are biologically dangerous to people that can get within the dangerous distances. So there's an unclassified definition of safe, which the crazies will say is uh, inadequate and your cell phone's going to kill you, but crazy going to crazy. <laughs> wow. If your microphone, if your cell phone doesn't kill you, your micro, my, your microwave oven will. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say. Um. <laughs> don't defeat the interlock so that it doesn't come on when the doors open, and you'd probably be fine. Well, that will probably kill you. <laughs> just it's because when you're defeating the interlocks, you will put your finger in the wrong place. It's especially bad when you're heating up uh, chili for three minutes, but you accidentally hit an extra zero on the time. <laughs> so, <clears throat> all right, so we covered uh, what it is, what is uh, available in the West, what the Russians temporarily made available before they decided that they hate us again. Um, 
But the thing that is interesting for me, I mean, obviously this is interesting, but uh, the part that I find interesting is that there are lots of side emanations, <clears throat> side emissions <clears throat> that are not uh, EM. And um, those uh, seem a lot more exploitable these days. Um, I mean, obviously, I suppose somebody may have a CRT. I have a couple here in the office. There is a there is a Commodore 64 up there, and there is a Mac 2 SI over there as part of my museum. But um, there is nothing sensitive up there. <laughs> and the screen that I'm showing you this on is um, is a gigantic Dell screen, but it probably consumes less than 10 watts of power. So there isn't a whole lot to go with in terms of the amount of energy. It's not it's not as easy as it was before, but <clears throat> um, uh, there are lots of other lots of other emissions that uh, that folks can go after. So um, one that I'm going to start with just um, <clears throat> just to get it out of the way since it's not 100% on topic is that um, somebody, um, I believe it was five years ago, and I believe it was a research team based in Israel. Um, I can't remember which university. Uh, showed that you could um, that you could um, attack a voice assistant. I believe that they picked on uh, on uh, Google's voice assistant spe specifically, but it would have been possible with um, with Alexa just as well. And um, in instead of um, using emissions, they were they were uh, introducing signal. And the way they were introducing signal is that um, they would use a laser. Uh, pointed directly at the microphone. The microphone in a lot of these devices is a surface mounted MEMS device. And um, by modulating the light of the laser, they could actually transmit voice into the microphone that the, the Google device could hear. Obviously, we couldn't. And so um, this was about five years ago before voice assistant the voice assistant devices started identifying the voice of the speaker and sort of having a, a built-in uh, authentication then the, the only authentication was can you reach the device right so you would visit a friend and the first thing that you would go is hey alexa set set an alarm for 4 a.m tomorrow and alexa would just do it so uh, what this team did was that they discovered that they could do this from across the street using a laser signal very carefully aimed at, um, at the MEMS microphone of, of a Google Home. And there is, um, there is all sort of uh, demonstrations of this. There is a paper, there is a YouTube recording of their demo at DEF CON. I don't think that this is a relevant vector anymore because they would have to mimic your, the fingerprint of your voice um, um, to get through, well, the only voice assistant I use is Siri. So unless you sound like me, it would refuse any private request. But that was um, that was an interesting thing. And from there, um, from there, a number of things have spawned. Let me see if I can just um, show you the first one. This one is, um, I think it's quite recent. It's um, a year, not even two years. Uh, I'm trying to navigate the screens here. All right. So this one has been referred to as glow warm, and um, um, 
and it's a 2021 attack. Let's see what we have here. If the, the Apple synchronization obliges me, otherwise I'll have to type the URL. Well, it doesn't, so I will type it. Strange. Usually things synchronize across Macs really quickly. Do I have a network connection problem? No. Hmm. As long as you're still connected here to Jitsi, uh, that, that tells you there's no network problem. At least not in general. Right. Maybe the remote site might be down or uh, not pingable right now. Hmm. Are you doing that in a separate browser window? Because we're still seeing the Kryptone uh, uh, page. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, searching for it. Okay. So when you pull it up, can you paste the URL in the chat window again? Actually, you should probably yeah. do that. You should probably do that for all the URLs that you're loading. All right. There we go. Agreed. All right, finally got, got it to work. So let's load it up. So this one is, there were a number of them. Um, I think in the, in the first decade of the century, there was one where Somebody demonstrated data exfiltration using uh, the lights of modem banks. So um, it was still in the, um, the modem era and there were yep. data centers just like we all know. <laughs> but then there were, there, there were modems on these racks at ISVs and somebody demonstrated that they could exfiltrate the, uh, the signal of the connection yep. by looking at, um, at the fading of um, of um, lights in these modern banks. Uh, this Frederick, is a fairly old paper. Frederick, we're still seeing the Krypton page. It, it's still loading. Then I'm referring to something that's different from what I'm trying to show. Um, so there was this one that was, I think around 20, uh, 2004. It was modem exfiltration, again, kind of like CL CRT exfiltration. Who cares? It's gone the way of the dodo. Um, but this one that I'm going to show you is um, is much more current. Okay, so we're going to do it this way. Ah, now that I 
found it the hard way, of course, it synchronizes. Computers always have to be fun that way. All right. So this is going. This is the overview page. Let's put the link here so you can also read it on your end. So <clears throat> let's go down the list. So this attack actually got its name, Glowworm. And I believe this was also out of a research group in Israel. I don't remember if it's the same group that did the, uh, the voice assistant attack or not. Um, but the, um, as you see here, the emanation is uh, power LED of a device. Let's see if we are luckier with the sound. Can you hear this? Yep, we hear you. Oh, we don't, no, we're not hearing the YouTube. You're hearing me, but not the YouTube. Okay. So it's make, basically making an introduction where it says that there is a, a danger because now people are working from home and there are many more eavesdropping targets. And uh, what they're trying to do here is eavesdrop on somebody that's joining a, a video conference from home. Okay, can you post the YouTube link into the chat box? Say again. John, say again. Uh, I was asking if you could post the YouTube link in the chat box. Uh, it's a, it's on the page that I just posted. Oh, uh -huh. maybe I didn't press enter. Did I press enter? Yes, I did. It's on the first link off of uh, Beanie's, uh, Beanie's page there. Okay. So and the attack here is essentially uh, recovering speech by looking at the variation of the um, of the intensity of the power LED um, on the device. And this is exactly what I was describing on the earlier paper, where people are doing it um, against modems by looking at the variance of the intensity of light on the on the TX or RX uh, LEDs of a modem bank. Now they're doing it at much higher resolution, looking at um, at the um, power uh, LED indicator of the device. And um, essentially they, they recover the sound of the conversation by, by looking at this. So the, the target in almost all of these is what you can see here in the picture, not the LED of the laptop, it's the LED of the speakers and the variance of intensity on that LED. And uh, I think their paper goes over a list of, uh, of hardware. They, they didn't do it with just one pair of speakers. They, uh, there we go, about 50% of the devices they analyzed were vulnerable to this. 
Google Home again. It looks like they uh, that this hardware is popular in Israel. <laughs> Logitech speakers, JBL speakers, Sony, Creative, Pebble. I have these. Great. Um, oh yeah, the, the Pebble has an LED on the on the right hand speaker. That's right. So the the LED, the power LED of the speaker is what they target, and using a telescope they uh, retrieve this um, this light variation uh, at a distance. And um, I think that the video continues with uh, them showing how they're doing this uh, across different offices. And um, they was not giving credit earlier correctly. And this is uh, Ben Gurion University. Um, I think this is one of the most recent things that have come out. And it ties back to the old one of, um, uh, of the modems that I was mentioning. But there, there is a lot of stuff like this. Um, so, um, um, Glowworm is the, is the most recent one. I don't think that the modem one has um, has a proper um, has a proper code name, but people were not into marketing vulnerabilities as much back then. Um, what else is there? Um, um, I don't have the link here in my list, but there is one. Strange, why is it not on my list? There is one that I find really cool that I wanted to demo. Um, now I'll do it eventually when um, when uh, scale lets me. Uh, that is called Kitap. Let's see if we can if we can find it. Let's try this way. Right, I don't have it here, but I have it in the research folder. Here we go. Right, there are a whole bunch of examples and source code on YouTube. So um, let's see. We can do this a little bit faster than the last time. Apple. Help. Yes. Thank you. So let's see. Let's, since you don't guys don't get the audio, let me play this so you can see it while I'm narrating. So Kitap is um, perhaps scarier, I think, um, <clears throat> because uh, Glowworm is interesting. The fact that somebody can remotely eavesdrop by looking at the LED of your speakers is interesting. But I don't think that the vast majority of us treat uh, our homes or our home offices or our, our co-working spaces as a skiff. Right, we typically don't discuss confidential information there. Um, and if you treat it as a skiff, you don't have windows. <laughs> yes, yes, good point. Um, so I, I don't think that people are that careless with information that is sensitive, but um, it's interesting. Glowworm gives you a longer range of eavesdropping beyond the the guy over there in in that conference room. So I need to worry about a little bit further away. Okay, got it. But um, uh, Kitap is interesting in a different way. So the emanation here is audio emanation instead of um, EM or, or light emanation. And um, 
essentially the idea is listen to the sound that you make when you uh, type on a keyboard. Can we reconstruct what you typed there? So that obviously has a direct application in terms of stealing your passwords. Um, but it's also a lot more insidious because I think that we do assume that sort of what we're typing on the laptop is probably hard to get to um, even in, in fairly open environments. So um, I don't think that people have the expectation that this can be that easily dropped on. Also, um, <laughs> well, obviously professionals do have that expectation, but normal people don't. Um, so this uh, key tap is essentially a little bit of code where somebody has trained um, um, an AI ML model because nowadays we do everything that way. And, um, and this model is, is um, figuring out what is that you type based on how your keyboard sounds or how your typing sounds. Don't get me started um, on machine learning. <laughs> Well, machine learning is a lazy way to do it, but it works. <laughs> and so essentially they're, they're retrieving the key stream just by listening to you type. That is, it, uh, this is it the entirety works. of the attack. Machine learning works if you, if you and the training set both already know the answer. It's frequently questionable in cases where Neither you nor the machine already knows the answer. Uh, well, machine learning is, is a very hyped optimization technique. Let's, let's call it that. Um, I think that that is really the problem. I mean, ML does, does something well, which is modeling things that we can't model uh, well enough. And sometimes model things that we can model perfectly well, but uh, but it's a cheap and fast way to model it rather than the analytical way. Um, cheap, that doesn't mean that fast it's... and and don't care how cheap, fast, and don't care about accuracy. Yeah. Yes, there is that. Too. So um, basically, the hype. The problem with ML is that the hype has overtaken the reality, even though ML is very interesting. Um, Right. Not the and, end and, of it, the world. and this is the this is at least the third time that that's happened. Specifically uh, yes. with the ML. It happens every time. That's right. Every time there I is an a, ML. I took a close look happened. at it at the last time. We can throw a hell of a lot more compute power at it now so we can screw up bigger. <laughs> I don't want to trigger your your blockchain response here, but that ML is not wise. that bad. It's it's just uh, it's just the amount of of hype that is that is annoying now. The fact that everybody seems to think that Chat GPT will will solve every single problem we have or take every single job we have, which is just ridiculous. I mean, it's a very good algorithm to generate um, to generate. Uh, sentences and, without and, understanding their meaning. So it's yes, exactly. It's sales. But, and, and, um, yes, and, but and, and that, guess what? People, people selling to... it do. The <laughs> people selling it do work in sales. But the um, NPR's headline was Chat GPT generates plausible sentences, not correct sentences. It also does it with Dunning-Kruger level of confidence. Well, it's it's very easy to to detect that uh, because it's it's interactive, right? So you ask a yes or no question of Chat GPT, and either the filter will intercept it, saying, "I cannot tell you if Hitler or Stalin is worse because my my company doesn't want me to tell you." Um, or if it, or you ask it, is Rel or Ubuntu better? It will say, well, I cannot really get there. Is Amiga or PC better? No, I wouldn't want to say that. 
you find one of these yes or no things that it's not being blocked. And the answer will come out as first sentence, yes. And with the, well, the first sentence will be a yes answer. The second sentence will be a no answer. Um, like, did the Soviet Union place offensive weapons in Cuba in 1962? There is a definite answer to that. But if you ask Chat GPT, the, the first paragraph will say that it did, and the second paragraph will say Excuse that it didn't. Excuse me. And any graduate student worth his salt can argue both sides of that question. <laughs> there you are go. ICBMs so offensive GPT weapons or are they defensive? <laughs> um, Khrushchev argued they were defensive weapons. Yes, yes. Well, you can argue both, but Khrushchev would have picked one and uh, the U.S. ambassador would have picked another, while chat GPT basically just goes into a tailspin because it doesn't understand the meaning of the question. Gobble. And so it, it gobbles up both. both and spits both out. If, exactly. if, if you're lucky, you get both answers from it, but frequently you get a very confident wrong answer. Not frequently enough to blow the... The cover? Hype. Mm. Well, the, the large portions of the press run with the hype. Uh, then don't trigger me on the, know, the propaganda has <laughs> got around the internet mm -hmm. before the truth has its boots on. Well, the, yes, exactly. The, the problem is that <clears throat> media, whichever type you want, social media, mass media, whatever, um, whatever offends you gets attention and media sells attention, right? So um, the scarier, the better, or the... Just Live streaming is on. Carry on. Okay, we're good. All right, so let's, let's catch up. So we, we covered uh, glowworm, which was uh, light type emanation. And now we have... Um, heat app, which are sound type emanation. Those, um, those are essentially the two new things that have come out in the last, uh, in the last couple of years in the open. Um, I don't remember if heat app is also associated with Israel. Um, I seem to remember it is, but I can't quite be sure. So let's go find out. Where were my links here? Should have the mm, GitHub. Okay. Let's see what we have on the paper. So there are there are multiple videos of this type. Um, mm, and they, they all look essentially the same. So we are we don't need to see them all. But um, the thing that's interesting here is um, uh, the Glowworm team, by the way, released uh, released uh, all their work, so you could reproduce it if you wanted. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the um, the um, Kitap author has um, uh, actually released uh, the source code. So you can reproduce it even more readily. I don't remember the weight of the trained model are here. Or if you need to build a data set and train the model. But um, the key tab system is, uh, is fully here. And there are three or four different videos of, of how to do this. Oh, and now there is a new thing that I hadn't seen before. You can try Try the system online. Let's see if we can do it. Let's see. No prior training required. Runs in your browser. All right.
am I supposed to type? Key presses up here. Let me type somewhere off screen. Mm, no, I'm not getting the sound to the to the application. Oh, there is a record button right there. Let's try that. I'm not getting the sound into the system. Uh, let's try something else here. Why are the microphones? Not. We're not muted. Now, of course, I probably crashed the entire system. Can you guys still hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can. All right. So that's a start. Let's see if uh, we can switch back to the other microphone. Yeah, it doesn't hear, even though it should. Hmm. Well, I think that they're fighting each other between the US and this thing. Okay, well, well, we'll give that up. But um, yeah, it looks like there is a way to try that in, in line. I was trying to see if it uh, could decode where I was typing, but we are, can't seem to get the sound all the way in there. Um, so that's the the second one that's interesting besides uh, Glowworm. Um, so there is some work that is finally getting out in the public in terms of these um, side emanations, not for not for uh, YEM because that's um, the government's domain, but for for light and um, and audio apparently. Um, so something is um, is starting to be discussed more publicly. Let me see if I have anything else. Uh, when I surveyed all the research, I may have found something. Um, uh, Federico, we're not hearing you at all now. Hey, Federico, we're not hearing you. We're not getting audio from you. Yeah, he may have had to turn that. He may have had to have muted in order to uh, record keystrokes. He's not muted. It looks like he's not hearing us tell him that, he's, uh, that we're not hearing him. I think his microphone is just dead.
Yeah, he's wearing um, earbuds that don't work well under Linux. But he's, he's got a Mac. That's different. Is there any way in Jitsi to get his attention if he's not watching the chat? Um, not really. Hmm. Actually, maybe we get maybe a private message would alert him. Let's see if I can find out how to do that. Send private message. Here we go. I bet a phone call would do the trick. That's true. I'm sorry, say again. What? Oh, you. Is that you, Federico? Uh, yeah, that's me. Can you hear me? Yo, can you hear me now? You've been like dead silent for about uh, probably five minutes or so. Oh, wow. So what have you said in the past okay. five minutes? All right. Interesting. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, we hear you now. Right. For some reason, the the main microphone is not connecting, but uh, I guess you can hear me from the from the microphone of the laptop. It's better than nothing. So I was uh, saying that um, besides the the key tap thing, so we we have looked at the audio emanations and the light emanations. Uh, there seems to be open research on this, while EM would have still the province of the government's work. Um, there is another result that was interesting that came out in the last couple of years, which is not not a direct uh, emanation. It's something that you can use when you have already compromised the target system. But it was uh, interesting because it's, it was also an audio result. And so the idea is that once you have compromised the system that is air-gapped, you can exfiltrate data using ultrasound uh, ultrasound signals. And um, those are not going to go very far. You probably can't leave the room, certainly can't leave the building. Uh, ultrasound requires quite a bit of energy to go far. But um, um, you can defeat an air gap with it, that's for sure. And, um, and it looks like you can do it uh, with mobile devices, not just laptops. So that was an interesting result in terms of exfiltrating information from an air-gapped system. Uh, I've not seen... Hey, it went silent again. The last thing we heard is we have not seen... Oops. Ah. I have to send the uh, private chat again. Private message. In, uh, a payment uh, transaction using ultrasound. Okay. Now, we didn't hear you for a little bit there. Uh, seems as soon as I click on private chat, I could hear you again. But uh, you were silent for uh, ever since you said we haven't seen, and then it cut off there. Uh, we have. Uh, did you catch the the summary of the different types? And well, the, did you catch the, the the ultrasound part? Um, if it was before that that we caught all that, yeah, which is. When you said we haven't seen, it just cut off in mid-sentence right there. You went, uh, we haven't okay. seen. Oh, we haven't seen. Um, I haven't seen a proof of concept of uh, of a nefarious attack using ultrasound. The the proof of concept that I've seen was um, was uh, essentially a payment system. It wasn't data exfiltration. It was basically a handshake with a target device to to do a payment transaction. I guess the the author didn't want to to build a, a nefarious system. But obviously ultrasound could be used as an as an exfiltration channel and his POC demonstrates it very well. And I think um, um, I think that's pretty much all that I have. Bill, do you know of some other interesting results, uh, some other recent interesting results? That's oh. <laughs> oh, I don't know anything. Thank you, Federico. I don't know anything recent and mm -hmm. classified. Um, the, the the keyboard training one is the 
most interesting combined with recent that I recall. Let me know when you're ready to try some pizza, sweetheart. Okay. But the glowworm is and and related are pretty awesome. You're getting a lot of noise. Uh, the, Everyone's unmuting. The glowworm seems to be pretty reliable. The the audio one is somewhat sensitive to. Uh, to the type of keyboard, like these shallow keyboards that Apple devices have are not ideal. You would really have to smack pretty hard to to get uh, it to work well. But on, on standard, not IBM style 1980s faculty keyboards, just on a standard desktop keyboard, um, the audio um, system works pretty well as well. And I don't believe that the model there um well it's a model so you could have learned anything but it's it's just a aml trained on a sample set right um the sample set is probably not large enough that it can use the the language that you're using as a way to to augment it uh, its accuracy um it's pretty well known that uh, you can um, you can um, uh, you can even recognize what language is being spoken just by looking at sequences of three or four characters, uh, which is largely what Facebook and others use to auto detect language when you start typing into an input box. So um, unless the training set for uh, Ktap is huge. Um, and that uh, AI wouldn't uh, wouldn't have that information. So th there there are ways to augment the result. Uh, they are fairly straightforward, which is just use the uh, use knowledge of the language, use use knowledge of the dictionary of that language, and um, uh, the AI is essentially understanding the layout of the keyboard and distance between the keys and the sounds um, that you make on different parts of the keyboard. And it's remarkable that it works well with with generic training for all keyboards. But obviously, if you have specific target in mind and you know what uh, type of laptop they use, you can train specifically on that. You can tune the algorithm to work against the MacBook Pro, um, and then the, the shallow keyboard will not be as much of a problem. Well, I also heard that Apple is is making the keyboard less shallow, so <laughs> maybe they're they're making it more comfortable for us, but also easier to use track. All right, that's all I have. Unless um, unless you gentlemen have any additions, I think we'll stop here. Okay, thank you very much, Federico.